world's largest collection of unopened water bottles. Hi, everybody. Um, welcome. Um, the, the, all of the same announcements apply. Uh, TSR, the South Hampton Review, uh, is still accepting submissions for the next five days. So if you would like to submit, uh, we need to have your stuff in by November 1st. If you would like to see that again, you can find it on Facebook at the Southampton Review or on Twitter at some thing that I can't quite remember <laughs> right now, Southampton Revy or something. Um, and uh, next week we have a wonderful panel of um, upcoming children's literature faculty and children's literature uh, students, graduates of this program. We have Emma Walton Hamilton, Peggy Kern, and uh, Tricia Rayburn coming to talk about children's lit. Um, so I hope you'll join us. And if you can't remember that, it will also be on Facebook at Writer Speak Wednesday. So please like us there. Um, also, we have um, in the last week tried, we've introduced a new thing, which is the prompt of the day, the writing prompt of the day. It is on the Southampton Review Facebook website and Twitter. And we'd love it if you tried to you know, follow some of the prompts and let us know what you think of them. So uh, tonight's guest, uh, we're really, really excited to have Kurt Wenzel with us tonight. He's the author of three quite marvelous novels, uh, Lit Life, Gotham Tragic, and Exposure. Um, the first two are about the writing life, and the third is about Hollywood. And so they're all matters of great interest to people like us. Um, uh, somebody, I can't quite remember who it is, uh, said that he's a cross between uh, Brett Easton Ellis and Salman Rushdie, but I actually <laughs> felt reading uh, his work that he's got a lot of Charles Dickens in him as well. They're just marvelous, funny, interesting characters that could live at any time, and I hope you'll join me in welcoming Kurt Wenzel to the stage. Charles Dickens, wow, that's good. Uh, thank you, Susan. Um, <clears throat> when I originally uh, found out I was going to read here tonight, I thought that I would uh, read from Lit Life, which is a, my first novel. It was about uh, a writing life and a satire about writers. I thought uh, it would be appropriate for tonight. But as this past month, uh, I've sort of been captivated by the Occupy Wall Street phenomena. And... Uh, so I thought I would read tonight from my third novel, Exposure, which is set uh, in the future in Los Angeles. Um, it sort of imagines a world, uh, a sort of over-advertised, corporatized sort of nightmare uh, America. Um, slight exaggeration of, of today, I suppose. <laughs> and um, it is... Uh, there is a, during the book, uh, there is a resistance that, that happens, um, which you'll get in the, I'll read the beginning of the book, and you'll see that sort of building, hopefully. Uh, but it reminded me a little bit of the OWS, uh, so I thought it would be appropriate tonight to do something a little different and uh, try out exposure. Um, I guess I'm going to start at page one. The couple of characters in here, one, uh, they can, first, the conceit of the novel is that there is a, uh, in this uh, world of exposure, there is an, an actor who is a um, mega, mega movie star. And um, he, he as, the, as the novel moves on, he may or may not be dying of overexposure. Uh, and they sort of based that on the myth of, the, the Indian myth that the more you're photographed, the more you lose your, you, you lose your soul. So it was a pretty fantastical uh, idea. And uh, uh, here we go. Okay. Uh, from his tomb at the Ming Blue, Malsha Reed watched the curtains part across the bearings with a cool silence. A Ming thing, he murmured to himself, setting down the remote. Men like him, whose lifestyles were predicated to a large degree on privacy, and whose behavior the trades characterized as unpredictable, usually found themselves a few blocks down at their marmont. But Marshall preferred the stark precision and monastery silence of the Ming. The Marmont, he decided, had grown self-conscious. Television stars on tasseled Harleys party in the Belushi bungalow. On past that now, he thought, or maybe behind it, 
<clears throat> either way was fine with him. He was 39 and had done his share without the self-congratulations. Real self-destruction, he knew, went on secretly and alone. Plus, he could work at the Ming. In this new cacophonous age, the Ming Blue offered the most exclusive of contemporary luxuries, silence, a, a hotel on mute, no squawking plasmas blaring at you in the lobby, no, th uh, no thumping rhythms from the bar. Of course, you weren't allowed to open the windows, but in LA, who cared? All this had made the hotel a popular destination for two primary groups, the faddish weekend media fasters, those who couldn't get to the mountains for the full cure, and high-priced screenwriters who could afford to work away from the lot. Marshall Reed was one of the latter. Though he had but a single screen credit to his name, the murder mystery Chula Vista, the script was generally considered one of the greatest ever written and had guaranteed him gainful employment in Hollywood for the rest of his life. Why he had failed to deliver on this promise even now, almost 10 years later, and why he contented himself with what in a different era might have been called hack work, were riddles still pondered by Sinise the world over. Deciding to take his breakfast by the pool, Marshall shook out his shaggy brown hair and dragged his slight frame into faded jeans and denim shirt, which he wore untucked in defiance of local fashion. He rolled the elevator to the roof and found a table under a cool niche of palm planters. There he sipped coffee while discreetly lifting his sunglasses as a young Nubian performed a brushstroke, legs lissom as the tail of a spermatozoa. Not until he had tucked herself away in a towel did he begin to scan the, the newspaper on his pod. Mr. Black was all the rage, of course. National Insider was announcing it had indeed secured an interview and pre-coverage had made the cover of the LA Times. Marshall had just started to read the article when he noticed the, his waiter, young Asian male in a blue Nehru jacket, hovering behind one of the palms. Hello there, the screenwriter announced, somewhat annoyed. Though his own celebrity quotient was blessedly low, there was a certain young Hollywood type, usually male, for whom the name Marshall Reed inspired a sort of cultish awe and at times an intrusive curiosity. He realized now that the waiter had been peeking over his shoulder at his pod screen. Knowing he'd been had, the young man stepped out from behind the palm. Sorry, he said, trying to keep his voice down. He pointed at the screen with his tray. I was just wondering what you made of this guy. Ah, the infamous Mr. Black, Marshall replied with chilly sarcasm. The waiter had that look of a budding screenwriter, he was sure, and so he would now have to be dispatched with benevolent firmness, the usual modus. Nice publicity stunt. The book had its moments, though. Marshall lifted his coffee cup to signal both a refill and dismissal. The waiter overlooked the gesture. I'm about halfway done with it. I think it's great. Well, good for you, Marshall replied, surprised at the rapture. Most people haven't bothered to read it, though everyone seems to have an opinion, don't they? Mr. Black, as he was known, had been named by default. It was nearly two years ago that a conspicuous volume had appeared on nonfiction tables in bookstores and on Kindle readers. It had a completely black cover, no title, no jacket copy, no author photo, no author as far as anyone could tell, and the publishing house wasn't saying a thing. As for the book itself, it turned out to be an augury, a digressive warning on the dangers of media saturation. There was actually a glut of such books these days, such were the ironies of the media age, and on the whole, things would have been dismissed as the rant of another killjoy except that the author's anonymity lent the whole thing an air of mystery, if not legitimacy. If for 500 pages you were going to harangue the age of the moving image billboards, or MIBs as they were known, the new giant digital plasma screens that had replaced static billboard advertisements, and smaller versions would seem to be popping up just about everywhere, on the sides of buildings, on the hood of cars, on changing room mirrors, and on interior bathroom stalls, at least this Mr. Black had the good taste to do it anonymously. However, and probably, the book had become a cold sensation. The author had defined some universal malaise in the mass subconscious, an, une an unease with the new visual technologies, a disgust with the insidious psychology of advertising. Owing to a particularly virulent strain of Hollywood self-loathing, Mr. Black's message had even been embraced by the entertainment industry. The author's suggestion of media fast, for example, extended dryouts from the image world, 
had become Los Angeles' new most fashionable diet. And there was not a person of stature in Hollywood who did not have a copy of the black book proudly displayed on his office desk. You're Marshall Reed, aren't you? Marshall nodded with a pained grimace. Daniel Lee, said the young man, putting out a hand to shake. I'm a screenwriter, too. Marshall shook the waiter's hand, lowering his sunglasses for a quick look. Daniel was new, he'd surmised, and not particularly well polished by Mink standards. Hovering near guests was forbidden, and engaging them in conversation was near blasphemy. Marshall thought to warn the waiter. He was probably being watched on the eye this very moment, but decided it was too late. Daniel Lee would be gone before lunch. Hey, I gotta ask you. Sorry, buddy, Marshall said, his hand shooting up reflexively. I don't read other people's scripts. He always felt like a heel saying this, but he remembered those times when he had tried to be nice and regretted it. Hollywood was enjoying its most profitable decade in history, which of course only thickened the sh city's sheen of desperation. Marshall had had his uh, pad address hacked countless times, and on other occasions had found screenplays taped under his hybrid, planted there like car bombs. <laughs> One poor soul had even sent a girl up to his room at the Ming, under her umbrellas of Sherberg raincoat, she wore nothing but thigh highs and a copy of her employer's spec script strapped in between her legs like a fig leaf. Here's the deal, she announced, looking the script and spreading her legs with a flourish. I sit here and watch you read it. When you're finished, and I hear it shouldn't take you more than an hour, you get this. Nothing personal, Daniel, he said. Just my rule. No, no, that's not what I meant. The young man laughed softly, shaking his head at the misunderstanding. I wouldn't do that to you, man, don't worry. I was just going to ask you about, you know, your career. Marshall straightened a bit in his, chair, in his chair. What about it? Well, you know, Daniel chewed his lip, courage waning. What happened? <laughs> Sun, sunglasses hid Marshall's eyes, though his mouth betrayed irritation. Of course, it was common knowledge he hadn't written a feature since Chula Vista. He performed polishes now, arguably the most sought-after practitioner of his kind. He also understood that young film geeks, having accomplished absolutely nothing, and therefore still able to harbor pie-in-the-sky notions about art and the sanctity of career, took a dim view of this. To them, the life of Marshall Reed had become a cautionary tale. Again, he gestured for more coffee and was ignored, the waiter continuing on with the digging of his grave. Like, we have this group of screenwriters that gets together for support, you know, and we argue about this sometimes. Whatever happened to Marshall Reed, I mean, we realize it's a system, these idiots at the studios, right? Even though you wrote a masterpiece, your stuff's just too smart for mass consumption. The system strips uh, wrong, uh, Marshall declared with quiet malevolence. He pushed himself back in his chair, the better to examine the young man in all his clueless glory. Where do you guys get this stuff from, anyway? Daniel didn't reply. I mean, here you are, a bunch of ambitious young screenwriters, and this is the best you can come up with? Some dreck about the writer and the system? Marshall took off his sunglasses, <laughs> setting them on the table. Okay, look, Daniel, let me clear some things up for you before you become all bitter, before you even get started. First of all, the people at the studios are not idiots, all right? Don't ever think that. That's boring and a waste of time. The studios are business, Daniel. Big news flash, I know, but you brought it up. Don't blame them because you and your coffee clutch buddies can't get your mediocre scripts produced. What do you think? A great project crosses the studio exec's desk and he says, no, nah, this is too good. We can't, we can't produce this. It's too, we're too stupid and evil. <laughs> it's about money, Daniel. Movies are expensive. They want a good return on their dollar. If you look at the profits, I'd say they're doing a pretty damn good job. Hollywood made more money this year than any time in history. That, I'm afraid, is precisely its function. Nothing more, nothing less. Marshall glanced to see the young Nubian standing to adjust her chaise. Now here's a suggestion, Daniel. Go out and make your own film. Seriously, there's no excuses anymore. You can shoot a movie on a cell phone now, for Christ's sakes. Your script's that good? Go make your own movie and stick it up their ass and stop whining. <laughs> Still steaming, Marshall leaned forward and sipped at the dregs of what was apparently going to be the last of his coffee, infuriating him even more. He had gone to bed just past dawn and now believed he was willing to kill for caffeine. Now about my career, he concluded. I wrote a pretty good movie some years ago, and I parlayed that success into a steady gig punching up dialogue that affords me a nice living. I eat well, Daniel. I drink the good stuff and only do the best drugs when I'm so inclined. I live here at the Ming. That's what happened to my career. How you doing? Daniel stood fingering his tray, face absolutely stricken. The screenwriter stood, 
shutting down his pad, he threw down some money on the table and made his way around the pool, passing the elegant brushstroker stretched out in her chaise. Her sorrel skin shone like a mirror in the sunlight, her knees supporting a large, glossy magazine. You were lovely out there, Mar Marshall whispered to her slowly as he went by. You made my morning. He did not look back to see her smile. Waiting for the elevator, he snuck a last glance toward the cafe and noticed two men in suits walking towards Daniel. One had already taken the tray from him, and the other had a hand firmly on his shoulder, ushering him from the premises. I'm going to skip ahead now to uh, Marshall goes to visit his uh, good friend, Colt Reston, who's uh, this movie star, um, and uh, they're old buddies. And he goes to his trailer uh, on the lot of this studio where Marshall is uh, uh, a, a hack, as they say. And uh, he and his buddy have this conversation in their trailer. Uh, they hadn't seen each other in nearly a month, and despite the embrace, it was clear that the awkwardness between them had not subsided. All was not well with their friendship. The days when they had been inseparable, when barely anyone in Hollywood would mention one name without the other, had begun to wane. Marshall could not say he was completely surprised. In fact, what seemed more surprising was how long they'd managed to stay close. Of the 14 years they had been friends, Colt Reston had been the number one movie star in the world for the last eight, while Marshall's career had been in permanent retrograde for almost as long. There was still a strong bond between them, mostly based on nostalgia, Marshall had concluded, but in practical terms, that niche where Hollywood alliances tended to subsist, their alliance no longer made, made sense. <clears throat> In fact, Marshall took Colt's allusion to Vancouver as a subtle dig. He had been called there for some last-minute rewrites on a spy throw that had spun out of control, and on arriving had found disorder and rampant self-indulgence, his choice environs. There were stories in the trades about a druggy set, and though the name Marshall Reed was never specifically cited, it was assumed that he was in the thick of it. Orlavio, Colt said, reverting to the director, running a loose ship these days, huh? He's old now, Marshall answered with calculated vagueness. He patted the couch, hoping Colt would join him. By now, Marshall had mostly accepted that it would never again be like the old days, when they would cheer a joint and play hologram baseball, hiding from the demands of the set like spoiled teenagers. By now, Colt had begun pacing in front of him, and Marshall caught him sneaking nervous peeks at him out of the corner of his eye. All right, Colt, you want to sit down, please? You're making me crazy. The actor kept pacing, and now Marshall realized Colt was not sneaking peeks at him, but just above, looking repeatedly in the mirror overhanging the couch. Marsh, I gotta tell you something, something that's been on my mind for a while. On the couch, Marshall arched ever so slightly. Despite some freelance work, he was essentially Colt, Colt Reston's private rewrite man, though writing was probably too generous a term. Working for Colt meant mostly eliminating dialogue, stripping away the chatter to get at the images, the brutish physicality. But now a bitter smile pursed Marshall's lips. He was sure of what was coming. My God, I'm about to be fired by the only friend I have left in Hollywood. He understood that Colt had been under pressure to get rid of him. Executives at Panoramic, the studio for which Colt worked almost exclusively, were sick to death of watching their biggest star spend half his morning making calls for a troubled screenwriter, trading in favors, throwing his weight around to cover up Marshall's various mishaps. They must have gotten to Colt while he was away, the screenwriter decided, the rumors from Vancouver having sealed the deal. And now, inconceivable as it had once seemed, their friendship was about to be thrown into the great Hollywood ash heap. I can barely think about anything else, Colt said. Marshall waited sullenly, get on with it already. But instead, the actor reached out a hand, urging Marshall off the couch. Come look at this, Colt said. I want to show you in a good light. Confounded now, Marshall let himself be pulled to his feet and herded into the trailer's tiny bathroom. There, the actor turned on the lights and stood in front of the brightly lit stage mirror, leaning his face closer to the glass. Now, don't bullshit me, Colt demanded, turning his head to the side to show every angle of his face. I want the truth. Marshall didn't know what to make of this. Had Colt's vanity hit some new plateau while he'd been away? He found himself pulling away from the reflection until Colt slipped an arm around his back and kept him still. Well, the actor said expectantly, well, what? Come on, I know you see it. Marshall laughed a little. What am I seeing? There's something different, right? Press closer now, Marshall had no choice but to consider the face of Colt Rustin. It was, by anyone's measure, 
an extraordinary countenance, the broad jutting jaw, the sharp nose, the impossible green eyes framed by sandy hair. But then he had also understood that Colt was very much a product of the digital age. Just as some actors had thrived with the advent of sound, others finding themselves displaced, so did Colt owe much to the iconic status to binary pixelation. Only in the digital monitor did his somewhat rough-hewn features seem to gain otherworldly focus and definition. Only then did they reach the warm, ethereal perfection they did not otherwise possess. Can you give me some idea of what we're looking for here? Marshall asked. Colt looked annoyed. It's right there, man. Come on. Marshall tried to stifle a laugh. He had watched Colt grow increasingly narcissistic in recent years, but had chosen not to condescend to it, giving his friend the benefit of the doubt. Who but Colt Reston could say what it was like to carry the fate of an entire studio on your back? Probably an agency, too, or to endure the gaze of tens of millions. Nobody before had ever experienced Colt's level of popularity and exposure, so there's really no telling which of his eccentricities were universal and which were truly neurotic. Clearly something had happened to him. Here now was a psychosis not even Marshall could excuse. Like what, he asked, trying to play along. There's something wrong, Colt said, poking at his face with his fingers, trying to heighten some flaw. It's right goddamn there. Just look at it. Marshall gave his friend another cursory examination, and then, mostly out of boredom, became distracted by his own reflection. He did not particularly like what he saw. Underneath the carefree appearance, the bedhead hair and light beard and aviator glasses, which it was assumed he wore to hide his bloodshot eyes, Marshall could see that his features were beginning to deteriorate. There was, most obviously, this sallow skin tone. Then the deeply etched lines that were coming too quick for someone not quite 40. He was running down, getting that rummy look. I could do with some serious pixelation myself, Marshall thought. All right, he told Colt. Maybe you look a little tired. Desperately wanting to move past this episode, he was willing to concede some dark, darker hues under his eyes. So you see it then. I said you look tired, the screenwriter repeated. Whatever else you think is there, I don't see it. Have you been to a doctor? Yes. And? Colt looked loath to admit it. Exhaustion, they said. You see, that's what I've been telling you. You're overworked. Overworked, overexposed, over everything, Colt added glumly. Just ask Mr. Black. Ah, the Black Book, Marshall thought. Almost relieved to have found some source for the neuroses. Colt had been singled out for ridicule in the work, and he was surprised to see how much the actor had been stung by it. With Marshall away in Vancouver, the words had obviously begun to nag at Colt again. Advertising is a new fascism via the MIBs, and Colt Reston is our Mao, our big brother. Shameless, banal, and overexposed, we are force-fed his amorphous, characterless image like ducks fattened for foie gras. He is nothing less than a scourge, an affliction. I told you a hundred times, forget that guy, Marshall said, Colt finally setting in, settling in next to him on the couch. A year from now, no one's going to remember Mr. Black, his book, or any of this crap. It's a publicity stunt to sell copies. It will pass. Can't help it, Colt replied, smiling sadly. The bastard put a bug in my ear, Marsh. Let's face it, he's right in a way. People are sick of me. My career's gotten away from me lately. Six movies a year, the publicity, the MIBs. You've heard about the vandalism? The screenwriter nodded. The blackheads, he said. No matter what you thought about the new landscape of Los Angeles, pro or con, Marshall figured you had to be intrigued by the blackheads. These were the hardcore fans of the black book, believed to be mostly college-age kids, and though there was no telling how many they numbered, they were proving a formidable nuisance nonetheless. Almost every morning the city woke to find another few MIBs slashed or spray-painted. Damage estimates were in the tens of millions. Not a single vandal had been caught. The rumor being that many in the city were secretly rooting for the blackheads and had turned a, blight, uh, a blind eye. There was a knock at the door now as one of the PAs stuck in her head and let Colt know he was due back on the set in 15 minutes. Thanks, sweetheart, the actress replied, flashing a smile that would make her month. Marshall couldn't help but feel a surge of pride. Fame had done many terrible things to his friend over the years, but Colt had always remained inordinately decent to the people around him. There were times this took nothing less than a Herculean effort, Marshall knew. A man in Colt's position, and he admired his friend for it. Oh, and some bad news, the young woman added. Her eyes flickered 
as she played with a mic around her neck, obviously dreading this part of her mission. Yes. She hesitated. Your website. Colt lifted his billion dollar chin. What about it? Well, we got a call. I guess someone must have hacked in. There's a new intro. It's doctored or something. I don't know, Colt. It's just really gross. I wouldn't even look at it if I were you. The webmaster said it should be under, under control by the end of the day. Marshall, however, was already there, typing in coltreston.com on the plasma. He scrolled down until he came to the offending image. Colt's face altered to a hideous death mask, eyes bulging out of a gaunt and ravaged visage, and underneath this, in a font simul uh, stimulating, simulating a handwritten scrawl, the legend, leave us alone. Okay, I'm going to read uh, just one more chapter, but I I'm the first, first writer to use the water at the uh, <laughs> Breaking tradition. We like that here. Good, good. That's rebellious. Um, I'm going to cut now to, there's a, another character. She is a ambitious uh, television journalist. So I guess, uh, in hindsight, it's actually sort of like a TMZ sort of person, but I guess she has a literary bent because she, she secured an interview with uh, Mr. Black somehow. So this is uh, Lindsay. She woke up as she always did, an hour before the alarm, skittish and tinged with an anxiety heading towards aggression. Not a bad state to be in, Lindsay figured. After all, there were deadlines to meet, ambitious upstarts, daily changing technology, ratings pressure, list adult copywriters and in-house crushes. Not to mention people who resented your color, your gender, your still tight ass and law degree. Lindsay and her morning ritual, quick call out to the coffee maker, followed by a three minute hand job, barely satisfying. Sipping her brew, she would start the curtains, sorry, part the curtains, to let in some gauzy LA sunlight, gazing down at the apartment complex pool to see how cold it looked for laps, trying to psych herself up. The Beverly Court was a luxury building, Inhumanely expensive, but somehow they'd forgotten to heat the damn pool. This time as she looked down, however, she flinched, dotting her curtains with coffee. Perched at the edge of the low-slung diving board was a large mountain lion. It balanced tentatively, the board vibrating ever so slightly under its weight as it leaned over to lap at the chlorinated water, the pool turquoise and blushed with henna highlights from the morning sun. The lion's shoulders and haunches were duly rippled with muscle mass, but the cat itself was a bit flabby, if she was not mistaken, somewhat adipose around the neck and chest. It was then that she remembered. Junk food big cats. It was a great story. The LA Times had recently had a small item about it, but none of the television news magazines would touch it. Might not be too late, Lindsay thought. It certainly wasn't going to get better any time soon. Urban sprawl had reached the foothills of the San Gabriels, luring wildlife down from the mountains, and slowly reshaping the food chain and delicate ecotone system. Along the outer sprawls of Northridge, Burbank, and Pasadena, deer by the thousands now feasted on the verdant lawns of gated communities, while the raven population had exploded due to the sheer tonnage of new roadkill. Then there were the catamounts themselves, who came down at night to binge on the poorly secured dumpsters of fast food restaurants and waste management facilities, and were now hooked, even more susceptible than humans to the addictions of MSG and a high glycemic index diet. Naturally, there had been ugly attacks. The dead night watchman, a mangled jogger, still alive. The dozens of missing house pets, and so new systems of garbage lockup and disposal were quickly enforced. But then the lions and their overstimulated opioids simply lumbered west, migrating towards regions where waste management hadn't yet caught on. Lately, there had been rumors of fatal maulings in Benedict Canyon and Los Feliz, of a foot taken to the ankle outside a health food store in Malibu. Then one morning's rush hour offered the spectacle of nothing less than a family of lions loping down the middle of Wilshire Boulevard, mom, dad, and little male cub, while distracted commuters slammed their cars into one another and terrified pedestrians huddled in doorways trying to muffle their shouts of terror. 
There were estimated to be as many as 40 lions in the North Hollywood Santa Monica Malibu Triangle. And it was said with a touch of hyperbole that there hadn't been such an anxiety in Los Angeles since the Manson murders. Make that 39 lions, Lindsay thought now, watching a new scene unfold bef below her. Across the court, a woman had appeared on her balcony with a cell phone, and sirens could be soon heard in the distance. Minutes later, two police officers were followed into the court by what seemed like a gratuitous band of six SWAT team members, inexplicably wearing their bulletproof vests. An appointed shooter stepped up near the pool's edge on the animal's left flank, resting a knee on a reclined chaise he took aim. Lindsay shut her eyes until she heard the shot, a surprisingly muted air rifle pop, and she opened them again, and when she opened them again, she thought the marksman had missed. There was no reaction whatsoever from the lion, though the shooter himself had fallen back in apparent satisfaction. The balconies were now filled with Beverly Court residents standing in their robes, calling friends or taking video on their cells. The lion simply sat on its haunches, haunches licking its paws, and it was only when it started to let out a few histrionic yawns that Lindsay knew it had been hit. Soon the diving board began to quake, a rapid quavering seemingly in opposition to the lion's own gentle movements. And then the big cat tumbled, legs splayed like the drunken fool at a pool party. Lindsay stared fixedly at the as the lion sank, a furry blur to the bottom. No resistance, she thought, no fight. It was not until the blood had turned the pool the color of a large Negroni that she thought to call the network and ask for a rush to a, for a vid team. Too late now, she decided. She'd have to hope for some good civilian cell footage for which they'd end up paying a fortune. Finally, Lindsay wiped away a drop of moisture heading down her chin a bead of coffee that had escaped her lips in the excitement and chided herself for faltering in the face of such good luck. Um, and lastly, I'm going to read all this little section of uh, Marshall, a little uh, interlude before he goes to a, goes to a lunch in L.A. Uh, the restaurant was at a hotel in Bel Air that had been around since the early 1980s, which by L.A. standards made it classic, practically old Hollywood. Marshall entered the lobby and walked straight past the crowd to the maitre d' stand. Trying to look casual, he made his way up to a large vase, and peering through thick cups of yellow roses, found Dre McDonald at his usual table, Dre is his agent. Sitting next to him was Lindsay Williams, the television personality who, one would assume, would now be riding a wave of success with her impending Mr. Black interview and who has the kind of statuesque good looks that kept Marshall secretly tuning in for years. She and Dre, Dre were kitty corner, maybe a touch too close for business. A late breakfast meeting turned into a flirt. Fair enough, Marshall thought, deciding this afforded him some extra time for his own bit of business. He walked to the VIP men's room, a special annex lounge that was a new LA status symbol and for which, somewhat shamefully, he had a key. Marshall, damn it, he heard as he entered. I was about to give up on your ass. Dana Wiggins was leaning up against a urinal, smoking a cigarette with a convincing aplomb of a gun mole. Perhaps she had once played one, Marshall thought. She was a talented character actress whose career had done a sudden flame out because of either her smart mouth or her widening hips, both, of course, in irrevocable sin in Hollywood. Marshall was upset that she'd taken the risk to smoke in here with the alarms and he jutted his chin at the two guys in suits behind her at the vanity, bent over what looked like an extravagant amount of bliss for lunchtime. You were late, Dana said with a shrug. They wanted to party. She took a last drag and threw a cigarette into the urinal, above which flickered a small MIB for children's vitamins. What, we're all friends here, right? Marsh, a voice called out as one of the men straightened up. When the man stopped digging at the heel of his hand, Marshall could see that it was Derek Samuels, a mid-level exec from Panoramic. Oh, great, Marshall murmured. And when the other man straightened up, he recognized him too. Lamont Turner, one of Net Talent's new agents. Degenerate fools, each of them, Marshall thought immediately. And he was reminded all over again what he hated most about this drug for which his name had become virtually synonymous, the people it put him in proximity to. 
the Hollywood monsters he found himself adjoined with in secret rooms. I got three more out there if you, yeah, that want to join us, Dana said. So excited that a lesser actress would have rubbed her hands together. You're my good luck charm, Marsh. They blamed us on Colt Rustin, too, Marshall reflected. It was Colt's success, after all, that had created this latest golden age, pouring hundreds of millions, billions, if he took the large view, into Hollywood coffers. This, in turn, had turned its usual trickle-down effect from Colt to the studios, from the studios to producers and agents, from the producers and agents to the actors, techs, and peons, from the actors, techs, and peons to the car dealers, landlords, waiters, and so on. Everybody in L.A. had too much cash, and just in time for Bliss to hit the streets. It was a drug prohibitively expensive, therefore instantly glamorous and desirable, of course, and reportedly the best high ever invented, possibly excluding mainline heroin. Production was not yet equal to demand, but in the Hollywood subculture of bliss, of chasing bliss, of knowing bliss dealers and how to track them down, of using bliss indiscriminately at parties, screening rooms, studio parking lots, and restaurant bathrooms, Marshall Reed was the man. Join us, said Derek, nostrils aflame as Lamont held up a small platinum tube designed for snorting. With you bums, Marshall said, turning away from the spread, I wouldn't piss in your shoes. The two men grinned, loving it. They were used to this by now, the scorn of Marshall Reed. They found it reassuring. Derek and Lamont were mid-level wonks, their days spent in anesthetized politeness with people too frightened to say maybe or even I'll think about it. So Marshall's free-willing cynicism had just the masochistic sting they craved. It played to the self-hatred they hid from the world and knew required tending. Yeah, why not Marsh, added Lamont. Shit ain't cheap. We're feeling generous today. Marshall looked again at the vanity. There was about five grand's worth spread out on a small tray. The beach sand texture of high-quality bliss. He sighed heavily, and then, with the harder of teaching them a lesson, nothing for himself, you understand, stepped up and did a line for each nostril, dropping the tube with a disdainful clatter when he had finished. Now Derek and Lamont smiled, waiting for the speech, the caustic bile they'd come to count off from Marshall which would be ignited by the rush of the drug. Well, guys, he began, stepping back to sniff up the residue that hung on the edges of his nose. I guess this, this is when you know it's really over, when you've officially bottomed out. He either grimaced or smiled bitterly as he handed Dana the roll of bills he had taken from his breast pocket, and she stuffed something in there in return. When you're tooting off in the VIP room at lunch, risking a career you have no right to have in the first place, that's when you know, and then it hit him. The rush slamming him like a jolt of electricity. He was jackknifed forward at the waist, retching, eyes burning in the surface of his skull as he reached out for something to hold on to. Finally, the contours of the urinal, finding the contours of the urinal, he remained there, hunched over, grasping to find his breath. Christ, you okay, Marsh? You all right? He heard Dana's panicked voice above him, muted as if from underwater, her hand rubbing his back. Oh, shit, don't die on me in here. Come on, Marsh. Tell me all right. Don't die on me. After a moment, he spat in the urinal and nodded. Oh, Christ, I'm so sorry, she said with relief as he slowly began to straighten. I should have told you about this new stuff. It's nuts. You have to cut it big time. These two bozos are trying to kill themselves. What do they care? From the corner of his watery eyes, he could see Derek snorting another line. Looking a little pale there, said the panoramic man with a smirk. Maybe he needs another, Lamont, Lamont added, something to bring the blood to the head. He went down for a quick hit and came up high-fiving Derek. Danny gave them both a finger and then turned to Marshall. How do you feel now? She held him tight at the shoulders and looked into his eyes, apparently seeing something there that she liked. Better, right? Go on, tell me how you feel. Marshall rubbed his eyes and his fingers against his cheeks to make sure he still had a face. It took him a few seconds before he could speak. Fucking amazing, he said. It seems as if it's 
somewhat effortless. And oh, I mean, because yeah, it's just, sure. you know, I mean, <laughs> things, things yeah. just seem to happen in such an orderly fashion that it feels real from the very first word. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about how you make that happen. That is just uh, going over it obsessionally. Uh, you know, I'm literally, I probably those, especially the first pages of a novel, I think somehow, because I, the way I work is I, I write a bunch of stuff and then I go back and I work on it until I'm happy with it. And that could take for, for months and I won't go forward. I can't go forward until I'm happy with what I've done. Mm -hmm. So actually the beginning of the novel ends up being a little more uh, looked over than the end. Um, but it really just comes from a sense of, uh, I guess if you read a lot, you, you begin to hear in your mind what, it, what a good sentence sounds like. And only through, I think, reading tons of, of material and finding the best authors do you begin to hear that there's a certain rhythm and a crispness to it that you have to get to. Um, and you, but it takes a lot of stripping away, it's a lot of obsessional um, of editing, going back to it, uh, uh, just to, to you just can't stand it anymore. Um, and then even again, nothing, nothing is ever finished. There's never a public, I mean, there's, there's a few books probably where every sentence is absolutely perfect and you wouldn't want to change it, but there are not many. Um, so it really is, it just comes down to sort of, uh, I guess, uh, reading and having an ear and then hopefully um, being able to go over it yourself until it's just etched like, uh, you know, as, as close to a diamond as you can get it. And even then it, it just fails. I mean, I'm just reading this now, I haven't looked at this in a long time. I see sentences I'd love to, I love to, I'd love to change. And actually, as I was preparing for tonight, I went through it and I actually changed a line or two, and just to, <laughs> because it just didn't sound good, you know. So you could just you could revise books to uh, to your to your dead, you know. So. Mm -hmm. That's great. Sure. Who are some of the authors who've been models of sentence making for you? Uh, yeah, I you know the the first people that got me excited. Um, I mean, the, my first literary crush, I guess, was Norman Mailer. Uh, but I just, I think, but it was more the, the person, personage and, and the fact that he was so hated, sort of, that, that, sort of, that was kind of cool, too. But his style was is so operatic and huge, I knew that that was not, I was not talented enough to do that or um, egocentric enough to do something like that. So the people, the, the sentences, I mean, if you read, there's a writer named Robert Stone, who I love. I mean, his sentences are just unbelievable. Um, Don DeLillo, I think, is fantastic. Um, I mean, he's written some books where I, I, I would, you know, there's nary a, a sentence that I would want to change in, in those kind of books. Uh, um, James Salter. James Salter, that's great. That's a great, a great example. Yeah, I mean, but he does, you know, his his sentences. Not only are they perfect, but then there are the images and the the lyricism of us is just. Unbelievable, uh, you know. I, I I always loved his work, and again, I tried. I, there was I went through a period where I tried to write like him, and it's foolish to try that. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, I think you know Stone and Delillo, I think are my my favorites. I'm still trying to get as, as as good as they are, but it's going to take a while, I guess. Yeah. Do you have the line that you changed, or one of the lines that you changed? I'd be curious. You want to hear? Like, yeah. Um, yeah, I gotta see what. I, I crossed out something. Uh, that might even be more interesting. I'll give you an example of, uh, of what I changed. Okay, I had to put it in, kin in Kindle readers because that hadn't happened yet, you know. So I, and I, that was whatever vision I had of the future, I had not quite got to. I, I, I couldn't imagine the Kindle. So, so I changed that. Um, was the pod the iPad? Yeah, well, in my mind, it was the, yeah, there was a pod, and now, actually, now there, I sort of envisioned that, and now there's the iPad, um, so I'm going to ask this deep job legacy for a, for a cut of that, <laughs> I don't think I'll be waiting for a while, um, but no, there's a, there was a good example of something that I, that I, that I cut, actually, um, okay, here, when Cold is saying, uh, Olavio, Colt said, referring to the director, running a loose ship these days. And then Marshall says, he's old now. He, uh, Marshall answered with a calculated vagueness. And I cut out comma, virtually assuring himself of an impending interrogation. That just seemed, that just irritated me that I, that I went on that long for something that didn't need to, to do that, you know. Um, so, and then there was another thing with, uh, with, uh, where is she, uh, uh, yeah, and here it was something I uh, 
it was uh, with Lindsay, and she says uh, in the middle of all this, she has a, a thought, uh, no, uh, better to wake up mad, better to go to work bleary-eyed and coiled, ready to strike. Uh, didn't need it, didn't need it. And so it was, I guess it was more cutting than actually changing lines. Um, so yeah, you know, you, you could do that for the rest of your life and it'll never be done. Sure. Um, your book takes place in the future, but it's not really an alternate world. It's simply the near future. That's right. Um, did you consciously map out what topics or themes you wanted to discuss in your storytelling, or did you just intuitively feel that, mm -hmm. say, the, the billboards, as you described, the MIBs, I think it was, or the, uh, the feral animals, or, or somewhat feral animals, was that conscious, like, I want to get into these topics, or did they just come through in the story as you started it? Um, a little bit of both. I mean, it really started with an image. A friend of mine, this is about 20 years ago, we were watching television, and somehow Entertainment Tonight was on, and we were watching these people. And we were just getting disgusted. We were sort of in a cynical mood, and my friend said, uh, boy, what if you could die from overexposure? Wouldn't that be great? And something about that, I thought, that's sort of interesting, you know, that's just... And then we, we hit upon this theme of the, you know, when I heard about this theme about the Indians believing that you could die. And as the, as the novel moves on, Cole gets more and more um, uh, worn down, and he starts to get, get sicker and sicker. And it's never really clear whether this is overexposure or what it is, but clearly this, this, whatever he's doing is, is, is uh, uh, it's a sort of a, he's a walking metaphor for the culture. So I started with that image. And I thought, well, I don't want to go, I don't like novels set like in 3000, you know, year 3000, and with buzzing around and, you know, <laughs> transporting themselves, and, you know, it's just too wild. So I liked the idea of sort of a near future that suggests the, the, the reality of where we are now. Um, so the, there was already um, uh, things popping up in, that I saw in the culture, they, like the, this idea of MIBs. I see this a lot more now, and it sort of, sort of scares me, but. I used to see these sort of glittering billboards every once in a while, and I thought, man, what if the, one day there's going to be a lot of these things, you know? Yeah. And now the economic downturn, it's sort of, uh, there's not as many as I thought there would be, but like when you drive into the Lincoln Tunnel, for example, you see they're all lined up, and that's something that I didn't see when I wrote this, but I figured that was coming. Um, so I think you just, you start with, uh, for me, I started with the central idea of the near future, and then from that, and my own obsessions about, uh, about the culture and where we're going and uh, the planet and the ecosystem and things like that, we're, and this book, sort of everything's sort of running down a little bit. Um, and it's exaggerated, but yet, you know, it's an exaggeration that hopefully makes you see uh, the contemporary world a little more clearly. So, yes? Me? Sure. Um, there was a sentence or line there he said he said with calculated vagueness, mm -hmm. and and like an MFA, we've learned ne never to to add on too much after he says or she says. Do you find it's effective to add on? Because that didn't do anything for me. But yeah, I mean, it, I think it's up to you. Well, it, it's it's just a feel. It's all feel. There's no right or wrong. I mean, there's I've seen writers break. There's every rule that that you can think of has been broken and been broken successfully. I mean, you had Jay McInerney here a couple of weeks ago. The idea of writing a book in the second person is something that is probably would be you know public enemy number one in a writing in a writing program you know back in the day. Now he he made it work. How did how did he do it? I, I don't know, but it was really well done. So it's just more feel I think and, and your instinct. Um, I'm not sure there's a, there's an ironclad rule about that. I think you have to go with your gut, and if you feel it that uh, whatever he said needs some clarification, then I think you go for it. If you don't think he needs it, I mean I think I always are on the side of less. I, mean, I think that's that's about the only uh, rule I would say that you would, you would go with. with. Uh, Gotham Tragic and Exposure were published within Spain about two years, correct? Uh, actually, uh, 2004, Gotham Tragic, oh, 2007, uh, for Exposure. Well, was there a period where you were trying to juggle like a modern New York and a... Were you working on at least two years I wasn't. At the same time at all? No? Okay. I wasn't. Um, <coughs> When you, I think when you're working on the book, it's hard to, I mean, it's so hard just to produce one. The idea of like, I mean, it really should, you have to be sort of obsessed with that world that you're in at that moment. Uh, to try to imagine another world simultaneously, I think it'd be very difficult. I mean, even if up until, I try not to start anything new until all the edits are done. Because I just, I'm so, you know, I'm, you know, you have so have to 
to be corny about it, you have to sort of fall in love with a certain universe. Or, and uh, so while that's going on, to have something else uh, intruding it, it doesn't work for me. Um, it doesn't work for me. But, uh, you know, it's funny, the books, you mentioned the time frame, and that, the books, the first one was written so easily, as it was a classic story of, I just sort of, it just sort of rolled out in eight or nine months. The next one took about, you know, twice as long as that. Then this one took a lot longer than that, uh, and it's a smaller book. Um, and it, you know, for a lot of reasons, you start running out of material, you don't want to repeat yourself. And at the same time, you, you become more rigorous about the language, and uh, you learn more. So you, you know, the first time around, you're sort of naive, and you just spit it out, and it's, you know, hopefully that it, it clicks. Um, but later on, you become, and, and, and by then, I, you know, I, I read, you know, 50 or so reviews of my book, so that gets in your head a little bit, you know. <laughs> so you're like, well, they're going to say, well, I'm going to do this because I don't say that. I mean, you shouldn't do it, but you can't help it. It's there. Um, so, Any questions? Sure. Have you ever read a review that benefited you, you felt? I'm sorry? Have you ever read a review oh. that you benefited from, you felt? Uh, you know what? You learn a lot more from bad reviews. You really do. Um, my second book, uh, which you know, I still think is, is probably my, my best, I think, but the, there was a real, there was an absolutely horrific uh, Sunday review. The word, I mean, it was just unimaginable. It was like, I mean, this, this, this is funny, because it was actually, you know how they have, sometimes they have a, it was me and another guy we were sort of put together. I don't know if you, his name's Kyle Smith, you know, he now he writes for the Post and does those sort of right-wing uh, diatribes, it's sort of sad, but he, um, he and I wrote, wrote books, I guess they considered it, some of the themes were similar. And uh, the review was, he just, this guy scorched us, I mean, it was unbelievable. And then, but there was a, usually there's a, sometimes there's a picture um, next to the review is you know somehow relating to the to the material, and ours was it was a it was a picture of a typewriter with shredded paper coming out. <laughs> so that tells you how bad it was. It was really bad, and you know what? There was some. There was one or two things in it. And I thought he's right. He's right. It was a little. Um, there was a glibness to my work. I think that he pointed out, and I think that was important to to hear. Um, the good reviews, and I've had a lot, and, you know, um, sometimes they could, they, you know, it's good for your ego, and you need to be nurtured by good reviews. You need to hear that, you're, that people think you're good, or else you're not going to do it. Um, but, the, you know, again, with the, my first book, I wrote it thinking that it was, I didn't, I, one of the worst things that can happen is that uh, someone told me I was funny. I think it was like Janet Mazin, actually, in the New York Times. She's, she wrote a review. And it was a great glowing review. You know, it was my head was ready to pop off. But she said the book was funny. I didn't think it was funny. I didn't know it was funny <laughs> until someone told me I was funny. And then in the next one, she said, "Oh, her review was, oh, it's the, it's the humor is too broad." So in a way, maybe I tried. You know, I thought, "Wow, well, I'm funny now. You know, it's, I'm real, I can do anything." And I, maybe I wasn't as exacting in how I uh, looked at that humor, how sharp it had to be. So. Uh, so it's both, you know. You need you need both. You need to be you need to be stroked a little bit, and you need to be put in your place. And I've certainly had both of those. So. <laughs> yeah, was somebody else over here? Uh, it seems like Colt and the character of Kyle Clayton both seem to they experience fame and acceptance, and then they are hit with backlash. Um, do you see that as sort of inherent to celebrity, or is that just incidental of these two characters? You mean the fact that they, they get it and lose it? Yes. Yeah. I think, yeah, I've always been fascinated with that story. I don't know why. Uh, and it's true. A lot of my, my, the one thing is, I think every book is actually quite different, except I do sort of follow a similar type hero through this landscape. He's sort of a, you know, heterosexual male, decadent uh, artist, and who sort of plays recklessly with his fame. I don't know why that is, is so entrenched in my imagination, um, to be honest. I, I don't know what, what it is. Uh, these things are sort of mysterious as to what your obsessions are. I'm not, I'm not sure what that was. I know in the first book, when I first imagined Kyle, what I thought, you know, the idea he'd done something good and then uh, squandered it, in my mind, the way I was living at that time, I was 30, I hadn't done anything, and I felt like I'd squandered my life. So, but I felt like I'd had some promise and I wasn't doing anything with it. So I sort of translated that on to uh, sort of a Brad Pack type person who had written a book and then couldn't follow up. So I sort of pasted my own 
experiences on to, I guess, a Jay McInerney or Betty Stinnell's type uh, character. And that's how I came up with it. Why that obsessed me, uh, I mean, I know why it obsessed me personally, but why as a character, you know, I'm not, not quite sure. Um, somebody else back here? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I was uh, speaking about your first book. I'm just curious uh, why you chose Sag Harbor and if you could talk a little mm. bit about your relationship to out here. I had, um, I was living in Manhattan. Um, I had a wealthy, a sort of eccentric aunt he used to have the uh, rent a house for us in Sag Harbor every year, and we would go and uh, spend the summer in August. We would spend there, and I didn't really know anything about the Hamptons, but I knew it was a literary um, outpost. So I, you know, I always looked forward to going out to Sag Harbor, and I knew that there were writers living there that I really admired. I mean, uh, I think I mentioned the name uh, John Street, and I think yeah, in, in the book as where the writer, uh, the older writer character lives, and I think that was a street, I think Yale Doctor lives on that street. I think I probably drove by one time and <laughs> parked and looked and then drove away. And William, I know William Gaddis lived uh, in East Hampton, so the Hamptons in general just had this sort of glow of, of a literary uh, haven. I think it's less and less now. Um, they're getting, you know, the writers are, I'm sort of the youngest person, I think, who's published a book out there. I mean, uh, you know, maybe, I think actually James Fry lives out there now, but you know, you have to make a ton of money to live out there. I mean, uh, you know, I just sort of backed into a cheap little house out there. So I'm, I'm really an exception. So um, so that's why, I mean, I think the Hamptons was a, I had been out there and it had this literary legacy that, that I found romantic. And that's why I wanted to uh, have my character live there. Uh, questions? So, well, I have a question. Would you sure. like to some romantic books for us over here. Sure. <laughs> this was absolutely, absolutely wonderful. Thank you so okay, much. Great. Thank you. Thank you everybody.